Section 5 of 3SF Short Stories by Paul W. Fairman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Secrets of the Martians, Part 2. Phanton, son of Vandor of the Bantarks, last great ruling dynasty of Mars, lay sick and dying in a foul cell under the amphitheater of the gods. He was old and tired and ready to die yet he longed for survival because his work was not yet done for two centuries phanton had ruled as lord of the north hemisphere he had seen the great prosperity of the planet even under conditions whereby the scientists of his father had foreseen the planet's death he had been there at the birth of their scientific magic fandor his father had been a wise and gentle ruler when the terrans came in their great ships Fandor had prevailed upon the council, and a policy of cautious retreat had been instituted. Fandor advocated this because he knew the Martian science was no match for that of the Terrans. Not that the wizardry of the Martian scientists was any less great, but they had bent their efforts in peaceful directions, while the Terrans came with huge warships and no end of armament. So the Martians, under Fandor, had retreated quietly to the north allowing the terrans to move on to the planet this policy was much despised by the young and the hot-headed who would have preferred to meet the invader face to face and die in battle if need be but the majority of the council was old and weary as was fandor and they prevailed then fandor felt he had lived long enough and refused to enter the place of eternal strength the greatest miracle of the martian science he died peacefully, and Fanton put on his royal robes. Now those robes had been torn from his body, and he had been refused access to the place of eternal strength. Pandek, the fiery young councilman, had overthrown him and assumed power, and the younger Martians were preparing to sweep down over the planet and slay the unsuspecting Terrans. They would be slaughtered, of course. This Fanton knew because the Martian weapons were puny, but there would be death and fiery agony before the Terrans finally won. Many times, in his heart, Fanton had wondered if the policy of the old ones had been wise. Fanton was a scholar. The books of the Terrans had been smuggled into the North Country. He had learned the language and read the books, and there was one Terran writer of whom he never tired, a genius named William Shakespeare. In his great play called Julius Caesar, Shakespeare had said, There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at its flood, leads on to fortune. Lying in his filthy cell, Fanton's mind was cloudy. He was not sure if those were the exact words, but the point was clear. Perhaps there had been a time in the affairs of the Martians when the tide of fortune was at its flood, when they could have won out over the Terrans but that time had certainly long passed, and if their present plight was the result of the old mistakes, then so be it. There was still no justification for mass suicide. So Fanton did not want to die. His work remained undone. Above his cell, in the amphitheater of the gods, Pandek was fomenting a kettle of hell's brew. Already they had used the place of eternal strength in a fiendish manner desecrated it and now they deprived their emperor of its healing magic fanton realized the die was cast he himself had been removed from the stage mad new actors bent upon destruction were reading their lines he fanton was finished tommy wilkes walked a long way down the dark passage his light picking a path through the gloom he knew he had already gone further than he should, but always there was the temptation to see what lay just ahead. And nothing was ever there. Only the sinister black passage leading onward. He explored another length, then stopped. This was far enough. What if he had unknowingly turned into a by-passage? Suppose he would miss the intersection on the way back. Thoughts such as these flared into his mind to bring a sudden sense of entrapment. The walls seemed to be closing in on him. He turned to retrace his steps. 
then he froze sound a far away echoing sound the soft tap of footsteps but coming closer tommy threw his light down the tunnel he strained his eyes ahead looking for whatever or whoever made the sound it was louder now and he realized too late that his flash was on guiding the menace serving as a beacon he clawed at the switch but his fingers were clumsy thumbs when he finally got the light out the footsteps had increased to a running tempo he turned and fled blindly back along the tunnel he had not taken ten steps when he tripped and fell he struggled to his feet in panic too late hard rough hands were upon him he fought but his struggles were useless twice rex had tried to maneuver the martians into removing the thongs from his wrists at the end of the rail line there was a pool of water fed by a spring he motioned toward his wrists and signified thirst one of the martians callously threw water in his face until he was grasping for breath his second attempt failed also and now he and jean were being led through a shining marble corridor the like of which he had never seen even in the finer buildings on terra what manner of world he wondered was hidden under the northern martian ice cap but the wandering storm made the corridor look like a tunnel clawed through bare earth it was a huge amphitheatre into which he and jean were rudely shoved they stood frozen their perilous position momentarily forgotten did you ever see anything like it jean gasped it must be an illusion of some kind i can't believe it really exists the floor upon which they stood was of pure glittering gold it stretched away in shining glory to a wall of crystal a window so high and vast rex could not conceive it as standing alone surely it had to fall by its own weight it dwarfed a high curved dais along which sat a line of richly robed martians in the center of the dais was an elevated throne upon which sat a scowling young martian but the thing that caught and held the two terrans were the towering cliffs of ice framed in the great window as by a master painter rex and jean were pushed forward as they came near the high throne the young martian smiled coldly as he noted the direction of their eyes he broke the silence you seem to admire our view you speak terran rex said surprised in his words a source of amazement to you no doubt you who consider us a mob of imbeciles cringing up here in the ice floes whoever you are i'm afraid you're in trouble we aren't used to being hauled around like criminals then it's time you got used to it who are you i am pandek ruler of all martians down on your knees rex and jean were hurled roughly to the floor rex lowered his head and whispered to jean take it easy we've got to feel our way and wait this out to pandek he said is this the way you're in the habit of receiving ambassadors from friendly nations friendly that from you who have kicked and despised us for hundreds of years pandek's rage was heightening with each word you and your arrogant army of invaders you who treated us with the patronizing kindness you reserve for amiable dogs we came in friendship with armed spaceships at your back uninvited unwelcome smiling like the hypocrites you are those entrusted with the government on terra would be happy to hear that you are willing to come forth and negotiate rex said pandek rose from his throne his brown face mottled with rage negotiate for what's already ours put our stamp of approval on your conquest of our planet rex saw that further words were useless he stood silent until the ruler's anger subsided then he asked what do you plan to do with us kill you as we will kill every terran on our world he eyed rex for signs of fear when they did not appear he seemed mildly disappointed when he spoke again it was in a quieter tone but first i would have you see a little of what martian science is like i would have you know how far ahead of the terran bunglers our scientists were even a thousand years ago 
i would have you know by what power mars will again come into its own i would like to see the work of your scientists conceit was obviously one of this ruler's weaknesses rex decided he hoped others would reveal themselves very well terran you shall see a part of the miracle concerning which you terrans have wondered for years the miracle by which your stolen lands below the polar circle have been watered and kept lush the ice cliffs yes i cannot show you the process whereby the rain and the snows are created and drawn to the pole each season how these great cliffs of ice are built over the winter months but i can reveal to you the most spectacular part of the process the melting of the ice cliffs in spite of their predicament rex was vitally interested jean also he glanced at her and saw the intent look on her face pandek picked up a device at his elbow obviously some sort of telephone and spoke into it his words were low and indistinguishable but the results were almost instantaneous a faraway hum was heard greatening in volume as from the release of sudden power a faint blue light appeared glowing the ice at the base of the cliffs the color shot up through the ice mass clear blue as new colors were added to that at the base red yellow purple crimson so bright they seemed to sear rex's eyes then they too started climbing up through the solid ice a deep rumbling was heard pandek said your terran scientists have not even begun to realize the power of nuclear fission two thousand years ago our scientists were ages ahead of them pandek said more but his words were drowned in the thunder of the crashing ice cliffs beyond the great window huge cataracts were even now pouring down the walls of melting ice both rex and jean stood awed at the sight of such vast and instantaneous destruction pandek smiled his cold smile the thunder subsided somewhat and pandek said i see you are impressed i would welcome your comments he was enjoying himself the display had astounded rex but the expression on his face remained cold i imagine you were responsible for sending the body of professor spencer back to terra pandek paused at rex's quick change of subject yes a fitting reminder to the terrans that we aren't animals to be gaped at on the contrary an indication that you are animals pandek half rose from the throne you'll die a little more horribly than i'd planned for that remark perhaps i will but the fact remains that you're mad to think you can stand against terra your scientific know-how is admittedly great but it's not geared for war you think not i'm certain of it i'm also sure of another thing what else are you sure of that you have no scientists then how you had them ages ago and they built well so well that their work has survived to this day what you have here was built by geniuses for fools to operate i'm certain all you do is press switches and reap the benefits of work done by long dead brains in another age the darkening of pandek's face told rex his words had cut deep in a way he felt sorry for the martian a hate-filled envy-charged man seeking to vent his rage in mad ways if carried to their ultimate his acts could only lead to the destruction of his people at the hands of the terrans but this made the situation no less perilous for rex and jean and other terrans on mars you hold a terran citizen he said the daughter of professor spencer is she still alive pandek was again enjoying himself oh very much so his smile held some hidden meaning as he said a trifle embarrassed perhaps at the moment but alive and healthy i demand you return her to her own people you demand i admire your courage what do you plan to do with her pandek's martian eyes grew speculative she fits into my plans as does the young woman at your side a new day will dawn upon mars soon a revision to the old days when mars was a virile fighting planet then there was less science and more emotion 
the masses were whipped into a fighting frenzy by supplications to the old gods pandek grinned wickedly human sacrifices were part of those supplications nothing stirs the people like the public sacrifice of a beautiful female with all its pomp and splendor it stirs them deeply the thought of it stirs you deeply you mean you're mad you're a dangerous maniac i can only hope your own people put you down in time with a howl of rage pandek leaped from his throne he drew a short ornamental sword from his belt and swung it viciously against the side of rex's head rex went down like an ox felled for slaughter jean screamed the rough-skinned martian who subdued tommy wilkes pressed him against the wall of the tunnel and used tommy's own flashlight for purposes of inspection he growled a few unintelligible words and seemed to be debating a problem tommy watched him silently warily without fear he had ceased struggling because it was useless but his mind was alert he had no way of knowing the martian was in a quandary he had been sent to check the tunnel entrance in the stone hutch on the wilkes farm but he had come upon tommy halfway to his objective should he take tommy to his superiors or finish his original mission it was indeed a problem the martian was not too bright also he was lazy the capturing of this terran changed things he told himself he would take the boy to the terminal then perhaps something would happen so he would not have to take the long walk back through the tunnel perhaps he would be honored for his capture and another would be sent to the hutch this hope brightened him as he took tommy roughly by the arm and hauled him toward the railhead tommy was not a difficult prisoner they moved swiftly but the boy was breathing heavily when he was pushed into one of the cars and the martian took the controls tommy rested awaiting his chance he had by no means given up hope it was just a matter of the martian easing up on his arm at least that would be the first step tommy was glad the martian had been contemptuous and not tied him up the car rolled smoothly along its tracks faster than the one used to transport rex and jean because the martian transporting tommy had always liked speed he liked it so well he opened the car to its greatest capacity and at one point had to release tommy's arm in order to put both hands on the throttle tommy struck instantly without thought as to the outcome only with hope and his hopes were fulfilled he hurled himself against the martian with both fists extended they hit hard brown hide just below the martian's right shoulder and sent him off balance the martian snatched at tommy while trying to regain his equilibrium and learned the folly of attempting two things at once but too late he teetered howled dismally and pitched in front of the racing car it hit him with a dull thud killing him instantly but his dead bulk also wreaked a kind of vengeance on the car lifting it from its tracks and sending it skidding along its side tommy had been thrown clear and as he hit the wall of the tunnel he knew he was done for every bone in his body snapped every ounce of his flesh crackled with pain he fell to the tracks and lay dying but the process was slower than he anticipated a full minute passed and he had not yet expired this puzzled him how could you live with all this pain with every bone broken it just didn't make sense tommy waited but death proved remarkably stubborn it refused to drop its black mantle over his tortured body finally tommy moved an arm a foot a leg odd they all worked he got to his feet he conceded that maybe the agony was not as great as it first seemed now that he could breathe again things were better there was only one bad place really a vicious bloody abrasion along his right forearm the lights of a platform boomed ahead tommy crawled over the car and stepped gingerly around the body of the dead martian then he hurried forward and climbed on the deserted platform here the light was better and he examined his arm 
it was an angry bloody mass but the blood was oozing out rather than flowing no deep wound had been suffered but it hurt like fury he could not bear to have anything touch it so he put his arm out at an awkward angle and left it there while he looked around wondering what this place was and also how hard you had to get hit and how much it had to hurt before you got killed his ponderings were interrupted by the sound of footsteps in the face of this there was nothing to do he decided but pick a direction and run back up the tracks no while the lights from the overhead bulbs were dim they would still reveal him at quite a distance the platform had two exits the running footsteps were approaching along one of these that left the other tommy plunged into it and ran he ran a long way and his surroundings changed swiftly the rail platform had been crude and uninspiring but now he was fleeing along a beautiful marble corridor he stopped for breath backed into a partially secluded niche and admired his surroundings was this the kind of place the martians lived in it certainly didn't fit into his preconceived notions of a place where backward ice people would dwell as his breathing lessened a tantalizing sound asserted itself upon his ears an odd singing sound both pleasant and mysterious he wondered where it came from he peeked out into the corridor and found it deserted the singing sound as he walked back along the corridor it diminished he turned and retraced his steps the sound greatened until he came to an archway in one wall of the corridor the sound obviously emanated from that direction the archway was supported by gleaming marble pillars and as tommy passed between them the singing sound rose to a crescendo that vibrated deliciously against his nerve centers then he saw it a beautiful domed room that gave a first impression of being a public bath of some sort but there was no water only brilliant breathtaking color all the gorgeous colors of the rainbow dancing down from the ceiling in beams of crystal clarity there was sound and color and something else a subtle something that made tommy very happy excitedly happy in a way he had never before experienced he moved forward completely engrossed in his new surroundings he moved in under the shower of color and a feeling of ecstatic exhilaration went through him it was wonderful then he froze not twenty feet away stood two martians clad in rich metal harness and holding long golden spears guards sudden fear swept tommy the martians were staring straight at him desperately he signaled to his frozen muscles let's get out of here but they failed to respond the guards stared at him he stared back nothing happened why they're asleep tommy thought in amazement they're standing there sound asleep with their eyes wide open holding their spears that's crazy why don't they fall down tommy wanted to run but he couldn't the curiosity of the very young not only barred retreat but pushed him slowly forward until he was standing beside one of the guards the martian had not moved a muscle his chest neither rose nor fell completely fascinated tommy extended his hand he touched the face of the guard it was rough and cool the guard did not move tommy laid a hand against the golden harness nothing happened he had not intended to push but he did he pushed so hard the guard tilted over on one stiff leg appalled tommy leaped back the guard kept on tilting until he fell on his side with a great crash of ringing metal tommy darted back through the color rays and out of the strange room so fast that he was far down the marble hall before his mind told him he was running he kept on running then he stopped as suddenly as he had started he looked down at his wounded arm he glanced quickly up and down the corridor 
then ducked again in a wall niche where he gave his whole attention to his arm. Had he dreamed all this? The horrible Martian in the tunnel, the car crash, the color room? He must have dreamed it. The proof was there before him. A smooth, unblemished forearm, where there had been a huge bloody bruise but a few moments before. He rubbed the arm, tested it. There was not the faintest sign of a wound. He looked around in bewilderment, peeked both ways and moved out again into the corridor. His luck had held for a long time, but now it failed him as sudden footsteps sounded in a traversing passage just ahead. They were coming swiftly. Tommy looked around in desperation. This appeared to be the end, but it was not. Fate seemed indeed to be toying with him, moving him around like a mobile chessman. At the last moment it showed him a doorway he had overlooked. The door was unlocked and he went through it as fast as he could while still closing it softly behind him. Inside, the light was very dim. Tommy listened at the door as the sound of footsteps diminished. He smiled, quite proud of his ability to take care of himself under these circumstances. He would certainly have a lot to put in his diary when he got home. If he got home. Tommy drove this last thought from his mind. He would make it. He was doing all right. Whereupon fate slapped him in sharply for his conceit by turning him and dropping him down a flight of stairs he'd been too busy watching the door to notice. The fall hurt, but Tommy was no longer frightened. He knew that so long as he had survived the car crash, no violence of this type could even dent him. He got to his feet and danced around for a while, holding a barked shin, then straightened as a new sound smote his ears. Someone was sobbing. A woman. A woman crying. It did not take Tommy long to trace the sound. He was in a narrower, lower corridor now, not one as fine as the big one upstairs. As Tommy moved forward, the sobbing told him he was going in the right direction. He opened a door. Inside the small room was a narrow, high-legged bed, more of a table, Tommy thought, but he gave it no attention. He was held spellbound by what lay upon the table. A girl with wrists and ankles bound down. She had long chestnut hair that hung down over the edge of the table. She was helpless. And she was completely nude. Rex got up from the floor to which he had been viciously hurled by three Martian guards. He and Jean were in a cell. As the barred door clanged shut, he turned to help Jean as best he could. Are you hurt? I, I guess not, she tried to smile. Only my dignity. I got us into a pretty bad mess. It wasn't your fault. I don't know who else it was. Jean strained at her bonds. They could have at least taken these things off our wrists. We can do it ourselves. That guard out there, he's leering in. Maybe we'd better wait until he leaves. Maybe he won't leave. Anyhow, I don't think they care whether we take them off or not. They stood back to back while Rex worked on the thongs binding Jean. The knots were stubborn, but they finally gave. The guard outside watching the process with amusement. Jean got Rex's wrist free quickly, and they sat down on the edge of the single bunk and rubbed their wrists. Well, Jean said, where do we go from here? To wherever they execute their prisoners, I imagine. But we're still alive. Aren't we supposed to keep the chin up like they do in books? He took her suddenly in his arms. You're a brave girl. She pressed close to him. I'd rather hear you say I'm an attractive girl. He kissed her hard. Does that convince you? She sighed and snuggled closer, oblivious of the leering guard. Thanks, mister. That's better. A gal doesn't mind dying, but she hates to go out feeling she hasn't hooked her man. Rex felt a catch in his throat at the brave front she was maintaining. And it had to be an effort. Jean was no fool. She was a realist. No need to tell her they were finished. 
that he was no superman who could kick down a wall and carry her to safety. "'Let's not think about anything but us,' she whispered. "'We have at least a few minutes to live, really live.' "'With that guard standing there?' Rick said bitterly. "'Well, then we can almost live.' She kissed him. A few minutes later, he said, "'Did you notice anything funny out there in that council room?' "'What do you mean by funny?' I was so busy looking at those tumbling ice cliffs. I mean the councilmen sitting on either side of Pandek. Not one of them moved or spoke. That's right. They sat there like dummies. A row of dummies afraid to move even their eyes. There is something else that puzzles me, Jean said. Those ice cliffs are life and death to we Terrans down below. Then why do the Martians build them up each winter and melt them for us in the spring? I'd think they'd leave the plains arid and thus drive us out. I wondered about that, too. There can only be one explanation. They've repeated the process for so long they're afraid to stop, afraid of what it might do to the overall welfare of the planet. Perhaps if they didn't, the ice would pile up of its own accord and crush them and their cities. I wonder how many cities there are. I don't care, really. Hold me closer. I'm cold. "'But I don't understand why they would do such a thing as this,' Tommy said. He had released the girl and found her clothing in a corner of the room. "'It's a part of some pagan rite they plan to revive. The victim must lie in, in the manner you found me for a certain length of time. Some weird-looking priests visited me at intervals and recited incantations. It was horrible. "'What's your name?' "'I'm Helen Spencer. I came here with my father.' Never mind that now. I think we can get out of here. There was nobody in the hallway when I came in. I'd like to find my father. We can try. They separated us a long time ago. For a while they treated me like a queen, even though they kept me a prisoner. I wondered why. Now I know. It was all part of this terrible pagan sacrifice. I think the time is very near. Then let's go but they had waited too long. The door opened and four Martian guards entered. They almost filled the room. Tommy hurled himself at the closest one, but was knocked viciously back against the wall. It seemed that fate had deserted him at last. The Martian in charge, one who stood a head taller than the other three, grasped Helen roughly by the arm. He seemed infuriated at finding her dressed. He threw her roughly after Tommy, and she, too, fell to the floor. The Martian stood there, undecided, some problem evidently occupying his mind. The three subordinates waited in silence. After a few moments, the leader turned and barked several sharp commands. The orders puzzled the three Martians. They stood where they were until the leader barked another sharper order. Then they turned and filed out. The leader stood motionless until their footsteps died in the corridor. Then he bent swiftly and lifted Helen Spencer to her feet. As she cringed away, he said, I'm Maxus, a dictor in the Emperor's Guard. I think perhaps you can help me. If so, I may be able to help you. You, you're speaking Terran, Helen said. Of course. Many of us know your language. He pointed to Tommy. Who is this one? I don't know, but I'm sure he has hurt none of you. Please let him go free. Maxus shook his head impatiently. It's of no importance. Tell me, while you lay here bound, did they bring a man to see you? A very old man, very feeble. Helen did not trust the Martian. After what had happened to her, she was in no mood to trust any of these people. There had been an old man. The priest and a tall young Martian had practically carried him in. They had stayed in the room for quite a while, the young Martian talking harshly. The older one had pleaded with him. Had the old man escaped? Helen wondered. Was this one hunting him down? You don't trust me, Maxus said. But you must. If the old one came, he would have been brought by a young one. The old one would have been horrified at seeing you. That's how it was, Helen said. 
Max's eyes flared. He laid a quick hand on Helen's shoulder, then drew it back. How long ago was this? Tell me, how long ago? Several hours at least. Then he still lives. They lied to us. Pandek lied to us. If you would explain. The man you saw, the old one, was Phanton, Lord of the North Hemisphere, ruler of Mars. Pandek told us of his death when he assumed the throne. Only for this reason did the Legion swear loyalty to Pandek, but Phantom still lives. Tommy had got to his feet and was brushing his clothes. Maybe not. They might have killed him in the meantime. I have a feeling he's not dead, Maxis insisted. I must find him. I must not fail to find him. He was turning toward the door. Tommy said, What about us? Max's turned back, and Tommy knew he was ready to leave them to fend for themselves. Tommy said, You promised to help us if she told you what you wanted to know. You're right, but you'll be in my way. A promise is a promise, Tommy said stoutly. Very well. We'll go down to the prison block. You two will march ahead. I will act as though I'm delivering you. But if there's any trouble, I will have to desert you. I cannot stand and fight. I cannot risk being slain until I find my emperor. They marched out into the corridor. The three guards had gone their way, and no one was in sight. But from the grim look on the Martian's face, Tommy knew peril lay ahead. The door to the cell in which Rex and Jean were in prison was unlocked. Five Martian guards entered. The leader was in high rage. This girl will have to do, he snapped. The crowds in the square will not know the difference, and the priests will just have to keep their mouths shut. Take her! As the three guards advanced on Jean, Rex went into action. He drove his knee into the groin of the leader, bending the Martian forward into a straight right that almost tore his head off. The Martian went down. His jaw structure so thick, Rex's fist turned numb from the contact, and the Martian was only dazed. Rex knew his one hope lay in getting control of the small pistol the leader carried. He lunged. The gun lay in the fallen leader's outstretched hand. Rex's fingers touched it, but the leader's fist closed. The delay was fatal. It gave one of the guards time to take one long step and kick Rex solidly behind the right ear. Rex went down hard, smacking the floor with his face. He did not move. Jean screamed. A hard hand went brutally over her mouth, dragging her down also. The leader of the squad said, Take her to the ceremonial room. Prepare her for the knife. Tell the priests I will be there soon. Aye, great Lord Pandek, the guard said. Jean bit the hand that lay across her mouth. It was jerked away. She tore loose and threw herself down on Rex's unconscious body. She was pulled roughly to her feet, and other hard hands dragged her away. End of Part 2